And it is the name that Orthodox Jews, even to this day, will not speak except on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And if Yahweh, if this God is for us, then who or what can be against us? And the, the question asked in such a way is to be answered, no one, nothing. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Kings chapter 6, looking at, at verses 15 to 19. Second Kings chapter 6, verses 15 to 19. I hope you found that in your Bible. If you don't have your Bible with you, we'll put the text on the screen for you. But stand with me if you would, and let's take another look at this text that we began to consider last Sunday in, in the context of the Lord's Supper. Thinking about this, open our eyes that we may see. Verse 15, when the servants, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, this is not the way, this is not the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And what this teaches us is so timely, so important for these days times like these. May the Lord, even as we're going through this passage today, as Joshua said, I, I pray that eyes would be opened of boys and girls and men and women who've never come to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but I also pray that eyes of the saints will be opened to see divine reality, to see this world not through the lenses of the newspaper or the news outlets are the neighbors, but through the eyes of the Lord. Thank you. Be seated. I told you last week that the context of this passage was a pretty bleak situation. Elisha, the prophet, who was accompanied by his servant here, they were dwelling in Dothan. And when you read it, it sounds like either the people were in hiding in Dothan or they had evacuated Dothan. Because you get this real sense when you read the whole passage there that that Elisha and the, and the servant are there alone. And the reason this Syrian army, this portion of the Syrian army has come to Dothan is because the king of Syria had set a plot to destroy the king of Israel and his army. And the king of Israel and his army, if you, read, if you read the whole passage before this and after this, were going to go a certain way, and that's where the plot was set. And Elisha sends word to the king and says, don't go that way, you'll be, you'll be trapped, you'll be slaughtered. And then the king of Syria hears that, that the Israeli army has diverted and gone another way, and, and he asks, who told them this? Who ifed our plan? Because in the king's mind, somebody in the inner circle, somebody in the military strategic planning had let, uh, had let loose lips reveal the plan. The answer of the king's wise men is that Elisha told him that. Well, the king says, how, 
How does Elisha know? And the answer is that if you read the passage, he knows what's going on in your bedroom. The most private place that a king could find himself. So to retaliate, the king sends a portion of his army to Dothan to surround and capture or kill Elisha. And what we're reading about here today is this servant who's full of distress, and I, he's not, not unlike me, not unlike us from time to time. The servant and the prophet. And I want you to see in this passage that there's a folly in fear. But when there's a focus in faith, things look very differently. So first of all, this folly of fear. The, the servant goes out in the morning and looks around. <laughs> and when he'd gone to bed the night before, things looked very different. There is, there is a portion of this Syrian army surrounding them in the mountain, ready to attack. And they've made themselves known. It's only a matter of moments or hours before they descend upon Dothan and, as I said, capture or kill Elisha. So the servant of the man of God, verse 15 says, rose early in the morning and went out and behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elisha, in verse 16, points out the folly of fear. He said, do not be afraid. Now, folks, if you just did a search for that throughout the Bible, you'd be surprised at how many times, just do the search for the word fear or afraid, how many times the people of God are told, don't fear, don't be afraid, stop being afraid. Fear, I will submit to you, is built into us, hardwired into us, because it comes from Adam's vine. The first indication we get that a, that a fall into sin has taken place is that they hear the first couple, Adam and Eve, our first parents, hear the voice of God in the garden and they are afraid. Fear is woven into our fabric as sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, as lost individuals, people not yet brought savingly to Christ. And faith and hope rise when the gospel becomes real to us and we, we commit our lives to Christ, though we still battle with fear. But there's a folly in fear. Elisha's answer to this servant is, do not be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, I don't know, but I wonder if the servant, when Elisha said that, looked around. That's what makes me believe that they may have been in Dothan by themselves. He doesn't. Those who are with us. <laughs> who? Someone has said that fear is false evidence appearing real. And there's a nice little acrostic to it. False evidence appearing real. The servant saw the circumstances at hand. Elisha saw the reality of God's promise to be with us. It's fascinating, this prophet in the Old Testament did, did not see a lot of things that we have seen. We, we, have, we have heard in the scriptures where Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. As you go, disciple the nations, 
Make disciple makers, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do everything that I've commanded you, which would include to say to these converts, disciple the nations. Disciples, telling people who become disciples to tell others who will become disciples. Disciples, making disciples. And lo, I am with you always, Jesus said, even to the end of the age. The promise of his power, all authority is given to me. The promise of his presence, I'll be with you always. We have revelation in scripture to let us see with eyes of faith, trusting God, those who are with us. In Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15, Joshua was by Jericho, we're told, and lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us, or are you for our adversaries? It's interesting. He says, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where, you, where you're standing is holy. It's interesting there. Joshua said, are you for us or are you for them? The answer was no. So folks, we learn from this. It's good to know that God is for us. The scripture promises that in the New Testament. But really isn't the more critical issue is that I am, I am for God. <laughs> if I am for God, if I'm a follower of God, if I'm committed to Jesus Christ, his son, then we have the confidence that he's for us. God doesn't choose sides, really. He chooses righteousness. He chooses holiness. He chooses justice. And any who embrace him in that, then you can say he's for them. This is a Second Chronicles 3, a 32, pardon me, Second Chronicles 32, 7 and 8. The people of Israel will tell this, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the horde that is with him for there are more with us than with him. Same statement. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. It should encourage us to be reminded of this. Jesus said himself, Matthew 26, 53, do you, not, do you think I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once send more, me more than 12 legions of angels? It's a powerful picture because when we study the life of Jesus and the great movements in his life, his birth, uh, his impending death, angelic hosts arrayed are at the ready to come out of heaven and pounce, whether it's to pounce to minister to and protect Jesus or whether it's to pounce upon the enemies of the cross. They are ready. They wouldn't even have to be assembled. He will at once, Jesus says, at once send more than 12 legions of angels. That's a massive army. So, when we're thinking about the, the folly of fear, I want to, I want to suggest to you, I read this the other day too. When it comes to fighting fear, to handling fear, we can either, another acrostic, forget everything and run, which is what I think the instinct is, by the way, or face everything and rise. Forget everything and run, turn and run, difficult times, flee. Or 
we can face everything with the confidence that however difficult the wind of providence blows into our face, by God's grace we will face it and come through it. But I want to think secondly about the focus of faith. Elisha has told this servant, greater are those who are with us than those who are with them. So Elisha prayed in verse 17 and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The servant as God answers Elisha's prayer, the servant sees what Elisha sees. Now I would ask you, do you think he was greatly troubled at that point? I think he was greatly comforted. There was an army arrayed against Elisha, but there was an, another army out, outflanking the Syrian army there for Elisha. Brothers and sisters, that's the way it is today. I don't know if you've been troubled as I have been when things are happening, I think particularly of Kim Davis, the county clerk in Kentucky who was jailed and probably faces more jail time. And people have argued different sides of her case. Well, she, she works for the government. She, she agreed to do things under the government when she took her position. Folks, she took her position 27 years ago. 27 years ago when she took her oath, she promised to uphold the laws of Kentucky and uphold the laws, uh, uphold the Constitution in carrying out her, her business as county clerk. Her conscientious objection is valid because there is no law that anyone can point her to by the legislature of Kentucky or by the Congress and Senate of the United States that tells her she must give out marriage license to anyone other than a heterosexual couple. There's no law. You hear people talking, well, she's breaking the law, but what law is she breaking? A decision made by a majority of Supreme Court justices? Just real quickly here. The Dred Scott, Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court declared African-Americans to be three-fifths of a person. A Supreme Court decision. Abraham Lincoln and others rejected that position as contrary to the law of God. And they're declared heroes in our day for it. Kim is just doing the same thing. And so, I don't know if you've been troubled watching what's going on, and there's, all, there's always politicians who will step in and try to seize the day and, and get attention to themselves. I understand that. But just look at, look at Kim Davis as representative of us, a believer who must obey God rather than men. That's, that's what she, she's driving her. Perhaps you've been frustrated because even so-called conservative pundits don't understand it. In other words, our so-called friends in the media get it wrong. What's my point? My point is that, that we have got to stop looking at any institution for our help and our protection. We need to lift up our eyes unto the hills as this, as this servant did when Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Lift up our eyes to the hills 
and know it's, it's from the heavenlies that our help comes. Our help comes from the Lord who has created all of this. And we must be willing to see as God sees and to see with the end in view. We read a portion of Hebrews 11 earlier. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because he who would come to him, Hebrews 11 says, must believe that he is, that he right now exists, and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Faith. What do we see today? What do you see today? You know, it's, it'd be easy to read the newspaper, listen to the news, listen to the radio, watch TV, it's news, and say, well, it seems like to me we're going to Hades in a handbasket. Well, the country that you and I have known is certainly under a great change. But the kingdom of God, of which we are a part if we're saved by grace through faith, is in great shape. We have a true king, King Jesus. So it doesn't matter if a, if a king in any of the foreign lands, or even if there's someone in our country who thinks he can be king, it doesn't matter. Our king who rules and reigns over everything, who can, who can summon legions of angel armies at a moment's notice, if you can even speak of a moment in terms of eternity. Our king is for us. What do you see? When you, when you talk to people, and perhaps they're, they're discouraged and they're down and they begin to talk with you and it, and it discourages you, Pray, dear God, give me eyes of faith to see what is and help me to communicate this to the troubled and the dis discouraged. Those who are worried and those who are wilting, those who wonder uh, what's going to happen to America. See, the answer is what's going to happen to America is exactly what God has planned for America. If we, if we will focus on the king, the sure enough king, Psalm 2, our, our holy king whom, whom God has enthroned in Zion. Look at Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. This is, you know, their chapter breaks are artificial in the scripture. They, they've, chapters and verses have been assigned uh, to try to dictate flow. But chapter 12, 1 and 2 comes on the heels of that great 11th chapter of Hebrews, 40 verses that tell us what faith looks like. And so in the light of those 40 verses, I would encourage you to read the whole, all 40 verses of chapter 11 sometime today. In the light of those 40 verses, the word therefore, in the light of what I've just said, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. This, and the word remember witness in the Greek is, is the word martyria. It's a, we get our word martyr right from it. So great a cloud of those, as, as the description goes in the 11th chapter, who saw in asunder, fed to wild animals, etc., etc. Since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight. If you read the, the rest of the passage here, Verses 18 and following. As soon as, as soon as the Lord opens the eyes of the servant and he sees the, the angel army with fiery chariots, the Syrian army descends upon Elisha and the servant. And Elisha prays again. It's fascinating. O Lord, blind their eyes. He just prayed for the servant, open his eyes that he may see. Lord, blind the eyes of the Syrians as they descend upon me. And he did. And they became one confused mess. And 
And then Elijah, Elisha says to them, so they, they somehow make their way, uh, probably those who were leading the charge make their way near to Elisha, and they're blinded. And this is what I referenced last week. This verse, you almost think that, that the writer of Star Wars got these lines for his character, Obi-Wan Kenobi. He said, this is not the way, and this is not the city. And he essentially says, I'm not the man that you're looking for. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. He led them to Samaria. If you read through the, on the rest of the passage, they, they're led by, they're blind. Somebody's got to lead them. They, he leads them to Samaria. They, they find themselves in the midst of the army of Israel, camped there. And then Elisha prays, Lord, open their eyes now. Let them see. And he opens the eyes of the Syrian army, and there they are staring the army of Israel. And they're surrounded by them. And the question comes to Elisha, should we go ahead and slay them? And Elisha says, why, why would you want to kill somebody who's been delivered to you by the hand of the Lord? Feed them, take care of them, send them on their way. And they go. And then there's a wonderful passage that follows this. I don't have time to develop this today, but I'll read these these couple of chapters here and see how God shows up. Because I submit to you today that God is more ready and willing to show up on behalf of his church as he's ever been. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight. What is, what is weighing you down? Perhaps, perhaps the Situation in the world is weighing you down. Now, folks, make no mistake about it. It's grievous. It, we ought to weep over it, what we're seeing happen in our world. Weep over it. But for it to weigh us down, lay aside every weight. And then the sin which clings so closely, and there is a sense in which, which constant fear is a sin. Because you see, fear, fear can only flourish in the heart of a person who is not trusting intensely in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't believe fear will ever completely leave us this side of glory, but thank God I'm looking for the day when, when, when fear is completely swallowed up by faith. The sin that other versions say so easily besets us, it so easily entangles us, it seems, to, it seems to fit too comfortably in our lives and let us run, which doesn't mean watch, run, let us move, let us advance with endurance, with a determination to finish to the end, to follow Jesus Christ all the way to the end. The race that has set before us, these cloud of witnesses are looking on. There are more with them than anybody, anything arrayed against us on earth. What do we see? Where does our vision go? Does it stop with sight or is it expanded into vision by faith in the promises of God and in the person and work of Jesus Christ? Verse 2, looking unto Jesus. You remember Peter. We read through it in Mark. Jesus comes walking on the water. Peter wants to come out and meet him. Steps out onto the water fixed on Jesus. Then he, he recognizes the lap of the waves around and he looks down and when he, when, he, when he takes his gaze away from Jesus and onto the circumstances, he begins to sink. And brothers and sisters, that was a historical reality then. It is an incredible lesson for us today. Looking unto Jesus who is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. How can I find joy, Pastor, in the way things are going in the world? Who, Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him? He found joy in anticipating facing the most unspeakable, unimaginable torment that physically we could have seen and we would not have recognized him, but more than physically, the spiritual torment where the Father who loved him laid on him the sins of his people and then punished him for their sins, for the joy that was set before him. 
he saw the end. He didn't stop by looking ahead to the cross. He looked ahead to the empty tomb, to the ascension, to the ruling and reigning, to the return. He looked ahead at the victory that is infallible and absolutely certain. And he despised the shame that was going on then. You see, folks, if, if we will focus our energies and our attention with faith in God, then the shame and the grief and the frustration, as the song says, the, we turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face, the things of this earth grow strangely dim. Both the things that would entice us off of, off of the path and both the things that discourage us and challenge us. The things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. What do you see? Really the question is who do you see? Do you in the midst of all of this are you able to see Jesus Christ crucified and risen, ascended, reigning, ruling, returning? Are you able to see him by faith? Do you have that vision? We can look at what folks call reality. You know, this is the people say every now and then to Christians, why don't you live in the real world? Folks, we're the ones that have the reality. They're caught up in false evidence appearing real. We're looking unto him who knows the end from the beginning, who's the Alpha and the Omega. Oh, I want you, I know... I know you can be discouraged. I know there are things that happen here that can discourage us if we're not careful. We long to see this church house filled. We long to see the sending capacity of this congregation enhanced that we send in the highways and hedges of the neighborhoods and the nations and, and you don't see that and you can get discouraged until we look beyond to Jesus who died, who loved the church and died for the church you can look at your own circumstances, the challenges you face physically, perhaps, and relationally, financially, whatever, however they manifest themselves. And if all you see is that, you can get discouraged. And cry out, what should, my master, what should we do? But when, you, when we're, our eyes are opened to see the glory of God in the face of Christ, the preciousness of our Savior, who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above anything that we know how to ask or think. When we're able to see Jesus in the midst, of, that's it, isn't it? To see Jesus in the midst of it all. To see Jesus not hampered or hindered by the circumstances, but Lord of the circumstances. Lord of his people in this nation, even if this nation begins passing laws specifically designed to go after his people, he is still Lord of his people. And he's able to use whatever Nebuchadnezzar is on the scene for proper correction and then able to destroy Nebuchadnezzar at his will. I want you to see. I want, I want you to have vision. I want to have vision. A vision of what Bethel can be. A vision of what we can be as a church family, as a, as a clustering of family units, as individuals growing in grace, longing to be disciples who make disciple makers. I want you, I want you to be able to see that. And that takes faith. It's going to take looking beyond the circumstances. And like Jesus, find joy. You look beyond the circumstances, you find joy. You find, you find heaven is our home. No more pain there. No more sadness there. No more sickness. No more sorrow. No more grief. No more death. No more sin. Whether it's our sin that we battle with or those sinning against us, no, none of that. When you look, so that's where I'm going. That's what Hebrews 11 said. They were, they were looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. So, so they realized, and folks, we may, we may be called to realize this. Our children may be called to realize this that if they kill us, that's the worst they can do is kill us. They, if they kill us, they simply usher us into the presence of our Lord. Joseph's son, 
who spoke from this pulpit several years ago, suffered under the regime of Ceausescu in Romania, when brought to the police station, that it was many times this happened, but one time the police captain was threatening him and threatening him, threatening to shoot him, pulled his gun out, put it to Joseph's head and said, I can kill you. And he said, he said, your greatest weapon is killing me. My greatest weapon is dying. You kill me, you think you'll be rid of me, but I promise you, you kill me and my blood will be sprinkled all over these sermon tapes. And they'll go all across the country of Romania. People say, why did this man, what was he willing to die for? That was, what was so important, so precious, he was willing to give up his life for? You see, if God be for us, who can be against us? No one can really harm us. In this world, we will have trouble. We will have pressure. We will be squeezed. But we've got to remember Jesus said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The world is not spinning out of control because America isn't, isn't stepping up. America ought to. We have in the past, but, but, but in the final analysis, none of that changes the fact that Jesus has overcome the world. And we are with him, according to Romans 8, we are in all these things more than conquerors through him who loved us. We just got to let God, in his word, define conquering. So it may be that our, our greatest weapon is to die for Jesus. Do you see? Oh, I want you to see. I want you to see him. I want our children and grandchildren to see him and love him. But I want those of us who, who've been saved by grace to, to, to love him and see all that he is for us, all that he has for us. Be able to fight fear with faith. and tragedy with truth and be people who live in this arena of, of time as Christ followers happy full of joy for what is set before us let's pray